Guys, starting next week, we're excited. We're going to be starting a new series uh, called uh, Creation to the Cross. Uh, creation to Christ. We're going to be walking from the beginning of Genesis all the way through uh, to the resurrection on Easter Sunday, and I'm pumped about that. Uh, today, though, we've got a little bit of something different. Uh, we're going to be talking about this idea that God is the first abolitionist, um, and the reason we're going to talk about this is because over the last uh, year, uh, we as a church have been involved in some stuff uh, behind the scenes that maybe some of you have heard about and know about. Others of you, maybe this will come as a surprise. You don't know anything about it, but that's okay. Uh, but stuff we have been uh, just involved in a conversation, involved in uh, trying to help tackle an issue. And that issue is uh, human trafficking. Uh, we've been uh, working with some different individuals, different organizations uh, in our city, in our county, in our area, uh, in this region of Northeast Pennsylvania, and just part of that conversation and that fight. And so as we've been walking through that, uh, we wanted to start off and take a minute here at the beginning of the year, just pause. And we're going to say, hey, we, we just want to raise our hand and we want to say, hey, we're willing to have a conversation about this. And so as we were kind of engaging that, I've been able to sit down with numerous individuals, uh, numerous uh, partners and organizations who are in the midst of uh, way more in depth in this fight. Um, and it's been uh, quite enlightening uh, for me. Um, as we've been doing that, there's one individual that I've had a great opportunity to sit down and talk with. His name is Derek Thompson. And in a minute, I'm going to ask him to come up, and he's going to open up the Word of God today and walk us through uh, this idea of God being the first abolitionist. Um, but before we do that, I want to tell you a little bit about him, uh, and then I'll ask him to come up, all right? Uh, most importantly, what you need to know is uh, Derek is uh, a man who has a wife named Alicia, and he has four daughters, all right? Um, I know that that is most passionate. That's like the thing you got on the front of your mind. So I'll mention that first as one of the most important. But let me walk you through his, just a little bit of his history as he's engaged in this conversation. Uh, Derek, I got some dates here, so I'm looking at my paper to make sure I get them right. Uh, in 2005, while he was working on one of his degrees, he was uh, first introduced to this entire idea of human trafficking. Um, and walking through a class in seminary, learning about it, saying, man, this is an issue we need to give some attention to. Um, but it wasn't until about 2012 that he was able to, as a pastor, move from a position uh, and really engage it full time. Uh, he did that by moving to Florida and working with an organization there that targeted and really went after uh, the idea of giving holistic care to victims, specifically in sex trafficking. And so he started working in that environment. He did that for a number of years till about 2019. He moved from there uh, to Lancaster, Pennsylvania area, kind of greater Lancaster where he resides today. Um, he and his family are there. Uh, he then started his own organization um, trying to really go after it, um, specifically focusing and targeting on the idea of combating uh, the demand for commercial sex. Okay? Uh, from there, he then in 2021 got recruited and kind of pulled into a larger organization called TFC Global that started an initiative called Gateway to Freedom Foundation. That organization is what he heads up currently uh, and works all over the place. Um, he and I have had a ton of conversations, and so I asked him, would you come and just open up for us the heart of God as we look at this issue? Um, so before he comes in just a minute, here's what I want you to know about him. Uh, two things really stuck out to me as I continued to have conversations with him. Um, extremely knowledgeable, extremely understanding of, of the greater issue at play, but one of the things that really stuck out to me was that pastoral uh, nature, that pastoral heart from seminary and being a pastor um, bleeds through him. It's extremely evident. You'll see it as he begins to talk and just walk through things. Um, and I love that about him. Um, his tenderness, not uh, towards the entire thing. Oftentimes we start this conversation, there's a lot of angst, um, a lot of uh, just built up tension. And he has such a tenderness uh, to help people. And I love that. The other thing that I personally benefited from in him greatly was his grace. Um, in those conversations, I'll just be honest with you, there were so many questions that flooded my mind. And I would say, I, I got a question. And he would go, what is it? And I'd say, I, don't, I can't ask this question. Because it, it feels blunt. It feels callous to ask some of those questions. And when you're, when you're even from a position of curiosity, trying to understand. Um, and one other thing I appreciated about Derek specifically is he gave me such grace uh, to, to say, no, 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 ask whatever you want. Trust me, it's okay. Um, it was amazing. Um, and from him, he answered my questions, engaged with me. It was huge. And so at this time, what I'd like to do is I'm going to ask 
uh, in a minute, dare to come up. Here's kind of what we're going to do. He's going to come, he's going to speak for a few minutes and unpack this passage in Exodus for us. And then I'm going to come back up at the end, and I'm going to spend a couple minutes with him in a Q&A and just ask some questions that maybe some of you might be thinking as he talks. Um, and I'm going to give him a chance to answer those, okay? Um, and then at the end, uh, I'll wrap up and we'll continue uh, with our time together and wrap up at the end. But Derek, would you come uh, restored? Would you give uh, a warm welcome to Derek Thompson as he comes? All right. Hey, welcome everyone. I am so glad to be here. I got to tell you. So Tim, thank you for those kind and encouraging words. Um, and I just have to share something about, uh, one, uh, getting a chance to meet uh, Pastor Tim, actually both of your pastors, Tim and Tim, uh, the duo, uh, is so powerful. In my work, uh, I have met with a lot of pastors in, in my time, particularly the past 10 years, and, um, and that's gone, that goes good and bad, meeting with pastors, I have to be fully honest. Um, and what I typically get from pastors, if I get their time, I know that I have about 20 to 30 minutes, and the body language is, what do you want from me, right? So I, I've got to give my pitch in 20 to 30 minutes. I've got to try to make it as engaging as possible and hopefully create some further dialogue and conversation. That was not my experience with Pastor Tim, okay? This blew my mind and was just such a gift and grace to me, uh, Tim, when I met with Pastor Tim, you want to guess how long we met for? Anybody? About three hours. Three hours. I think I heard it. Two, two to three hours that he, he gave to me, which is such a grace. And he was so interested and engaged and curious, as he said. And that was a blessing to me. That it wasn't, and the, and the, the body language wasn't, what do you want uh, from me, what do you want me to do, but how, what can we do for you? How can we help? And I see that emanates here at Restore Church. I feel that energy here. I feel a very warm, welcoming, engaged uh, community here, and I know that's not by accident. It's the grace of God in this community. Amen. So, guys, thank you so much already for your hospitality and for what you have already, how you've already impacted my life in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So as Pastor Tim mentioned, though, I have been involved in anti-human trafficking work. Uh, the past 10 years, it's been full-time. It's been quite the journey. Uh, but really, it did start in 2005 um, when I took this class. But what I'm excited to share with you, I'm going to share a little bit about my journey and what I've learned about this issue through the years. Um, and uh, what I really want to focus on, though, is the heart of God for this issue today. And what I want you to know, and I hope that will come through, is that we have so much hope when it comes to this issue. I know that it's a, a scary and dark and sometimes can be a fearful issue for us to engage in. And honestly, many of us want to run the opposite direction, right, from this issue. But what I want you to know is that we have a tremendous amount of hope because of the character of God that's been evident from the very beginning when it comes to this issue and for us as a people. So we don't have to hold our heads down low and our shoulders down and, you know, just be, you know, give into like a pessimistic attitude or mindset when it comes to this. Because of God, Amen. because of God, we have so much hope. There is life, <laughs> there is redemption, there is restoration, there is healing, there's everything we need as people to be able to engage this issue and not be harmed by it. Amen? Amen. All right. So... Um, for me, this issue started when I took a class in seminary, Fuller Theological Seminary. Uh, classes can change your life, by the way. I don't know, any students in the room here? Anybody in student? Okay. There are some classes that can change your life, and for me, uh, there was a class that God used this class to change the direction of my life. Um, I was at Fuller Theological Seminary. It was my second quarter. I remember meeting with my student advisor, we were trying to fill out my schedule for that quarter, and I had one elective that I needed to fill. So we got my schedule all set, and there was one class we still needed, and I, <laughs> it still blows my mind to this day that that elective was a class called Children at Risk, 
And uh, my student advisor said, Derek, I think you might be interested in this. It's a new class to Fuller. Um, would you want to take it? And I said, sure, having no idea. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Just sure, okay, I'll take it. Sounds interesting. And uh, God used that class to change my life. In fact, it was this book. I bring this with me often when I speak and share on this topic because this does remind me of how it all began, how it, how it started for me, how my journey began. And so for that class, we had to read this book. And you can see it's not a very intimidating book, 63 pages long. I remember it's called Children in Crisis. And before that class began, our assignment was to read through this book. And this book was just giving a brief overview of five different ways children are in crisis in our world today. And it was chapter five that broke my heart. And I'll read the chapter to you. In fact, it was the title alone. I remember reading this, and it felt like a sucker punch to the gut when I read the title alone. And it's this, Children of the Sex Trade. Is it possible to be born a second time? That was the title, and it took the wind right out of me. And I couldn't believe what I was reading. I remember thinking, this is ridiculous. There, there's no way there's a sex trade, and there's no way children are caught in this. This can't be a real reality in our world. But I continue to read, and this chapter, again, it's only a few pages long, but it was just giving a basic overview, some stats and some stories of uh, children who are caught in sex trafficking today. And it was a heavy, heavy burden that God laid on me. I just felt even that whole quarter, you know, kind of changed the whole tenor of my, my, my time at Fuller, but really that quarter just felt very heavy and as I was just contemplating this reality, are, you know, that there are children that are caught in the sex trade and it, it's exploiting them and oppressing them and harming them. And so I remember from the very beginning, and by the way, a little bit about my personality, I am a zero to 60 kind of person. I don't know that there is more than just an on or off switch. <laughs> there is, you know, you can kind of take baby steps. I don't know how to do that. And so really from the very beginning, I was all in. I said, Lord, if this is happening, if this is real, if people, if there really are children that are being harmed in sex trafficking, whatever you want from me, Lord, I, I will do whatever. I'll go anywhere, do anything. You know, I, I am completely yours. And so God used that season of Fuller to begin to educate me about this issue. And I just want to share briefly before we get into God's word, a few things that I've learned about the issue of human trafficking as I began to engage with just a full and open heart. Just like Tim, wanting to learn, who is this really impacting? Where, where is it happening? What's being done to stop it? All of those questions. Okay, so the first thing I learned is that this issue is relevant. It's relevant everywhere we are. So, like most people, when we first hear this, we think that it's happening overseas, and that was a thought of mine for sure, that it's happening in, in remote places around the world. But what I had no idea is that even while I was in Pasadena, it was happening within my neighborhood and community. I found that out about a month or two after I started taking this class. I was speaking with a coworker, uh, a, a classmate of mine, a friend of mine, and um, I was telling him about this issue. And he said, Derek, you have no idea. Uh, my friend was working at a drop-in center in uh, L.A., a youth drop-in center. And he said, just uh, last week, we had a 15-year-old girl come into the drop-in center, and she didn't want to leave. He was a case manager there, and so he met with her, and they were providing different services for her, and she didn't want to leave. She was staying there as long as she possibly could, and they finally asked her, why are you still here? And she says, well, uh, there's a person out front for me. He, he's my pimp, and he's waiting for me out, outside the door, and I don't want to go to him. And so my mind was completely blown. I had no idea that right here in my own backyard where I was living, that this issue was relevant. I didn't have to go overseas to make a difference. Amen? Amen. And I've since come to find out that in any community, any city, this issue is relevant. So for us here in, in the Wilkes Bar, is that how you say it, by the way? Wilkes Bear? Wilkes Barry. Whew! I was so nervous about this last night. How am I going to pronounce? Yes, Wilkes-Barre. Thank you. Wilkes-Barre. Got it. Okay. Please forgive me. I am new. And I also, Lancaster, by the way, 
I was saying Lang Lancaster, and that was a big no-no. So you got to be careful how you say things. Around. <laughs> but Lancaster, Wilkes-Barre. Okay. So anywhere and everywhere I've gone, I've, I've come to see that sex trafficking is a global and local crime. It means, yes, it is happening overseas, but it's also happening right here in our own backyard, which means that you and I don't get a pass. We don't get to say, well, not really anything I have to deal with. This isn't my issue. You know, that's other people that have to deal with that. So it's, it's here. Um, the, a few other things. I eventually, as, as Tim mentioned, I started working full-time with an agency in Sarasota, Florida called More to Life. We were doing, uh, as he said, holistic victim services. I was working directly with victims of sex trafficking in Sarasota County and the state of Florida. We also had some victims uh, that uh, came from out of state. Um, but got to do, be a part of every aspect of this issue, from working directly with victims to advocating for more resources and uh, things that they needed on the legislative le level and also local level, um, job training and placement, uh, community awareness and education, prevention education, pretty much anything and everything. And a, a few very important things I learned there is that one, again, this issue hides in plain sight. And what I mean by that is it doesn't always look like we think it's going to look. It, it looks a lot more familiar, a lot more, more um, integrated into our community than, than often we're aware of. For us in Sarasota, what that looked like is that everybody knew where the prostitution track was in Sarasota County. It was between Sarasota and Bradenton on 41. We began to do outreach uh, on that place. And this was hiding in plain sight. Everybody could see these women walking the street and knew what they were doing. Most people did not know, though, is that they had started as sex trafficking victims and were being exploited and oppressed. And so for me, when I first started to learn that, it was horrifying to me that how many times have I been passing by and, and seeing this happening, but didn't have the eyes to see, didn't understand what was really going on. And with that awareness and education comes different responses. We respond differently when we see it the way that we need to see it. Amen? Amen. We also had uh, teenage uh, victims that we worked with. Uh, we had a drop-in center as well. We provided holistic care for them. Many of our teenagers were in local public high schools. We had them back in school, and they were living their life. And talk about hiding in plain sight. The teachers and the students that were at those schools had no idea that their student or their classmate was a sex trafficking victim. And yet I knew that's exactly what it was. And so this issue hides in plain sight, and the awareness and education is critical for us to have better responses in, in dealing with it. If, we're, if it's happening right in front of us and we don't understand what's happening, we, we can't provide the, the response that we need. Amen? Amen. Secondly, in this issue of anti-human trafficking, and particularly anti-sex trafficking, there is a, a very... Um, we are lacking resources. There is a huge lack of resource. As a victim service advocate, I can tell you, we had to work miracles with the small budget that we had, and we never had enough uh, uh, residential, good residential care for our victims. We were always with that pressure point of how do we provide care on a limited budget with limited resources. And this is what anti-sex trafficking organizations continue to go through today. And so as a community and as a county, we need to be asking ourselves, how can we help increase the resource? How can we make sure that we're not trying to, to work miracles every single day? Yes, God can work miracles, but oftentimes he does that through our generosity and help and support. And so we need to do a better job of resourcing uh, the agencies and the people and the community groups that God is calling to be a part of this. Lastly, I've learned that our prevention efforts in this area are lagging far, far behind. We are doing a great job. Well, I should say we're doing a much better job of providing victim care, and we need to continue to do that and increase those efforts. But at the same time, we have to start rolling up our sleeves, if you will, metaphorically and now literally, <laughs> um, rolling up our sleeves and getting to the prevention side of things. That's where my heart truly lies, amen? And I'm sure your heart truly lies there as well, is that we don't want to just continue to have the revolving door of, of victims and continue just 
allowing uh, victims to be exploited and oppressed and harmed. I hope for a day in which there are no more victims of sex trafficking. Amen. And to do that, we need to really up our prevention efforts and, and begin to really uh, solve that problem. Why do people become victims in the first place? What's perpetrating all of this? So those are a few things I've learned in my uh, experience in, in this issue. More important than any and all of that is what I've learned about God through this issue and the hope. And as I share with you that God is the first abolitionist. I remember when I first was grappling with this, it felt like the sucker punch to the gut, took the wind out of me. I was just heartbroken and felt that heaviness. And one of the first places I turned to was God. Lord, what do you say about this issue? What hope is there? Can this really be overcome? What do you say about it, God? Do you care about this issue? And what I found is that you don't have to go that far in God's word to get an answer. Amen? Amen. It's in the second book of the Bible. <laughs> the Exodus story is such a powerful, rich, important story, not just for the people of Israel and their slavery in Egypt, but for every single one of us still today. Because it's through the Exodus story that God reveals his heart for the people of Israel and for you and I today. Amen? Amen. And I want to read what God reveals about himself. Okay, this is God's self-revelation to the people of Israel. And what we know today is that his same self-revelation that he shares with us today. And what he shares to Moses is so important. We're going to turn there now in Exodus chapter 3. And I want you to hear these words. Now, God has set the scene in a very peculiar way. I don't know if any of you have had a loved one, like a spouse or a parent or a good friend, that ever said to you, we need to talk. Has that ever happened to some of you? We, we, we really need to talk. Did your interest peak up at that time? <laughs> like, did, did that get your attention? Like, uh-oh, what do we need to talk about? You know, like, uh, I'm a little concerned here. Well, the burning bush was God's way of getting Moses' attention. He was telling Moses, we really need to talk, Moses. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Moses was doing his normal routine. He was a shepherd. He had a sheep. This is a picture of Mount Sinai, by the way, a modern-day picture where, where this conversation supposedly, not supposedly, where this conversation took place. Um, and God, God um, through that burning bush, was saying to Moses, Moses, there's something I really need to tell you. And so he got Moses' attention. He came, and this is what God wanted to tell Moses in this conversation, picking up in verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Amen. So there are some really important things that we learn about God through his self-revelation here. And the first thing we learn about God is he says, I see the people of Israel in their slavery, and I hear them crying out. God sees and he hears. He is not aloof. He's not lost up there in the clouds somewhere, disconnected from our reality. God says, I see the people of Israel in their slavery. I hear them crying out. And the, then the most important part, I am concerned about their suffering. Amen? Amen? I am concerned. The root word there for that is compassion. God is saying that he's not only sympathetic to their plight. Sympathy is God saying, I see the people of Israel, I hear them crying out, and darn it, I wish there was something I could do about it. But oh man, I just, you know, nothing I can do. 
I just feel so bad for them. That's not what God is communicating here, amen? God says, I see, I hear, and I am moved to action. I am concerned. God then gives two promises. He says, therefore, I have come down to do what? What's his promises to the people of Israel? To redeem them from their slavery and to bring them into a good land. God is saying, I see you, I hear you, I am compassionate, and I am moving to affect your redemption. I am going to redeem you from your slavery, and I'm going to bring you into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I think, I'm pretty sure now, I've read this story many, many times, I'm pretty sure Moses really wanted God to end the conversation right there, amen? Yeah. <laughs> hey, that would have been great for Moses, right? Hey, you care about my people, this, you know, my, my kinsfolk that are left in Egypt. You want to redeem them and save them? Yay! That's good news, right? But God continues. The last thing we learn is that God then commands Moses. He says, Moses, I have a job for you. I want you to personally get involved in this. I care about this issue. God is saying, I am going to redeem the people. I'm going to bring them into a promised land, but Moses, you have a part to play as well. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is God's heart for the people of Israel. This is what he said he was going to do, and he did do. And just in case we think that the Exodus event is a one-off event, or a one-off concern of God. And I know that was a temptation I had. Okay, God, it's nice that you did that to the people of Israel, but is that, is that really your character for all people? I want us to turn quickly to Exodus 22. And I want you to see that this is what God revealed to Moses is God's character and his desire for any and every person that is oppressed and experiencing exploitation. Turning to Exodus 22, verses 21. Now this is, God has kept his promise, by the way. The people of Israel have now been redeemed out of their slavery in Egypt. God did what he said he was going to do. They were about to enter the promised land, and it's when God gave them the Ten Commandments and the law. And he was preparing the people of Israel for their life in the promised land. And this is what God commands the people of Israel, one of his commands in the law is in 22, verse 21. It says this, you shall not, so this is to the people of Israel, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. That word sojourner is a foreigner or an alien. So you shall not wrong a foreigner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child, and then listen to this part. If you do mistreat them, and they cry out to me. Amen? Amen? If you mistreat them, if you oppress the foreigner, the widow, or the fatherless, and they cry out to me. God says, my anger, you can re read on, I'll paraphrase now. God says, my anger will be aroused, and I will kill you with the sword, and your children will become fatherless, and your wives widows. God is making it abundantly clear to the people of Israel. Don't get it twisted. What I did for you in Egypt, if you turn around and you begin to oppress other people and exploit other people, my anger will now be aroused against you. Amen? Amen. This is God establishing his character once and for all for this issue of exploitation and oppression. God is making it abundantly clear through his actions that he does not tolerate people being oppressed and exploited and harmed in the world and that he will take personal action to affect their redemption. Amen? And so, God today is it possible, based off of what we know, 
in Scripture that God sees and hears the cry of the oppressed in our towns and cities today? Would we venture to say, yes, he does? That he is not aloof? That he's not just up there somewhere, unconcerned, maybe a little sympathy? Oh, man, that's too bad. I wish somebody could do something about that, but, you know, I'm just so busy (laughs) running the world. I got... I got too much on my plate. No. God sees and hears the cry of the oppressed today. And God is in the business of redemption and restoration and healing. God says, I will do that. And then he turns to us, Tim. He turns to you, the church. And he says, I have a job for you. Amen. And I will be with you in doing it. So the question for you and I is, Lord, what would you have us do? Lord, how can we be of service? Where do you want us to go? What do you want us to say? What can I give, Lord? I want to end with this. I know this issue can be a very heavy burden. And it can be intimidating. And in fact, it can also sometimes for a lot of us be very harmful because it can create a lot of shame. It can create fear. It can create anxiety. It can create anger. We get very angry when we see people being oppressed or exploited. It can do a lot of harm. It really can. And so I want you to hear these words of God. We're going to end with Matthew chapter 11. And then we'll pray. Because this is also, this issue I have found is a a paradigm for what God is doing on a much larger scale for every single one of us. We are all oppressed and exploited by sin in the world. And we all have our own daily struggles. I don't know exactly what yours are, what you're going through, what is afflicting you, what is creating fear in you, what is oppressing you. But I do have hope and know that what God did for the people of Israel and their slavery in Egypt is what he does. That's his heart for you and I as well. And he says, I see, in, I see your pain. I see your, the ways that you are being oppressed, the ways that you are being exploited, the ways that you are being harmed. And I am deeply concerned. Therefore, I have come down through my son Jesus, to bring you redemption and healing and life and wholeness. And I will bring you into a good and and spacious land. Amen? Amen. I will bring you into the promised land. And so I want you to hear this invitation from Jesus, God's son. This invitation, by the way, he he had a, a similar invitation to his 12 disciples. It was a very specific invitation to his disciples to come follow him. This invitation is for anyone and everyone. So it is open for all of us. And this is what his invitation is. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Restored Church, I hope that as you engage this issue of human trafficking through awareness and education this month, as you begin to learn more about it, and you begin to start feeling maybe some of the burden that this issue has, it is a heavy burden. I pray that you will lay this at the feet of Jesus. Do not carry this burden alone. Do not carry your burden alone. The things that are oppressing you, Jesus gives us this invitation and says, come to me. You can lay down all the things that keep us up late at night, all the stressors, all the pain. He says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. I know for me in this work, I would not have survived 10 years if it wasn't for accepting this invitation of Jesus in my life. Amen.
I am not that great. <laughs> probably, that's probably evident. I'm not that strong. I'm not that talented. I don't have an, enough compassion in my heart. I mean, I am lacking so many ways. And so this invitation that Jesus gives to come to me and to find rest, Derek, it's not all on you. Restore church, it's not all on you. You don't have to solve all the world's problems. You don't even have to solve your problems. Come to Jesus. Find rest in him. Find healing and restoration. I'm telling you, when we do that, watch out, world. Watch out. Because God say, I can do big things. Moses, I'll end with this. Moses, do you think he really thought he was going to redeem the people of Israel from Egypt? He thought it was a death sentence. He kicking and screaming. I do not want to go back, Lord. Please, no. Do you think he was surprised and amazed at what God did? Do you think it just blew his mind yep. that, oh, I can't believe that he, he kept his promises. And that's what happens when we as a faith community, as a church, come to Jesus, find our rest in him, put our hope and trust in him, and then watch out. God does amazing things. He keeps his promises. And so let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much for this morning, Lord. I thank you so much for the word that you gave Moses, Lord, and the hope that it gives us still today, that what you reveal in that conversation, Lord, we cannot overstate it. We cannot take it for granted, Lord. You revealed yourself to be a God who sees us and hears us. You see our pain. You hear us crying out to you, and you are concerned and compassionate about us, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. We know we don't deserve that. We know, Lord Jesus, that you do not have to be involved in our messy little lives, Lord. And yet you choose to come near us, Lord Jesus. You say, so I have come down to redeem, to make whole, to bring us into a good and spacious land, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord. I thank you for trusting us, Lord. I don't know why you trust us to, to be a part of your work in this world, Lord Jesus, but thank you for trusting us, Lord, and saying, I want you to be a part of this healing and restoration. I want you to be a part of fulfilling my promises in the world. Lord, we confess our weakness and our sin. We confess our limitations, Lord Jesus, to you this morning. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would come into our hearts and minds, Lord, and give us rest. Give us the hope that we need to live faithfully in the world as you call us to. In your holy, precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Derek. Um, I'm going to get uh, move the table here a little bit. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, yep. Let's yeah. He just mentioned this whole thing at, uh, at the end. I thought it was awesome. I was thinking about it the whole time. Uh, Moses was scared. <laughs> and we know that because in the passage... Uh, God says to him, hey, well, hold on, let this be a sign for you. Afterwards, you will return to this place. You will come back and you and I will meet here on Mount Sinai. That, and he says, this will be a sign to you. I will bring you through. You will stand here again, which means you're going to be alive because you're going to be standing. <laughs> you're going to make it through, um, which is so encouraging to me, right? Because we have promises that we see God promise us. This is what's coming. And we have reason for hope. We have reason uh, to long for that hope, right? One of the things I love about our church, I love you, our church, the people of our church, is that when I, when I entered into this whole conversation, um, I thought of you guys. And I thought, man, our church is going to go nuts, man. We've got to figure out a way to help. <laughs> Here, here's why. Let me, let me explain why. Here's why. Okay. Um, as a pastor at Restored, I, along with the other pastors, we have a privilege we have a great privilege to be here. And one of them is that we know your stories. Many of you, not all, but I know many of your stories. And for many here at Restored, the truth is you were in a place. You cried out to God. That place might have been different. Hmm. Different places, different stories. Totally understand that. But you were in that place. 
And you cried out to God from that place. And he heard you, and he saw you, and he rescued you. Praise God, right? Okay, so I know that. And what I know about you is that you know, you know, you know what it feels like to be in that place to call out and to know he heard you, he saw you, and he pulled you out of it. Amen. And he rescued you, he redeemed you, he redeemed me. Praise him for that, yes. right? And so we know what it is to be in that spot. We know what it is like to be rescued. And so when we're having this conversation, like there is hope. Someday God will hold everything accountable. Everything will be held accountable. Someday it's going to happen. Between now and that day, we have a privilege to get started on helping people find hope yes. and redemption. Um, beforehand, I, I, in part of the conversation and setting up today over the last few months, um, Derek and I, along with some of our friends who are here with us, I'll talk about in a second, um, in preparation for this conversation, we just started saying, like, what are some of the most commonly asked questions? I'll be honest, I asked them, and then asking them, going, hey, what are some of the questions that you were, you're asked all the time, and can I... Can I ask them in front of everybody so that if anybody is asking them, you can answer them? And, and so we kind of talked about that. So what I want to do is I've got, I just have like four questions. Yep. Okay, five. Yeah. Maybe yeah. We'll, keep, and we'll try to keep it to that, okay? Yeah. Okay, so, so here's, here's the first one. Just kind of enter into this conversation. Maybe you're asking some of these questions, maybe not, um, but they're really helpful. Uh, you mentioned this in this conversation and as you were talking through your story. Uh, one of the things you learned was that this is definitely global, but it is not just global, it's local. Yep. And so one of the questions I asked you and we talked through was, um, so how, how relevant is this in Wilkesbury? How well of it relevant is this in Northeast Pennsylvania? Um, like, can you speak to that? Can you just kind of walk through that a little bit more than you necessarily did in the message? Absolutely, yep. So one of the important things that w we have a lot of resources and tools at our disposal, uh, which is a, a great place for us to be right now. Um, there are a lot of good organizations that are doing some data and research. I will say that in the, the field of human trafficking, it is very, very hard to get full data, right? Think about this. Nobody's raising their hand saying, yes, I'm a human trafficking victim or a sex trafficking victim, right? Yes, yeah, count me, right? It's very, very difficult to get the full data. So the, the, the data that we do have, we know, is not the complete picture. But it helps us kind of project of how serious of an issue we have. And one of those organizations is the Players Project. They actually um, have, they created the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And uh, Pennsylvania ranks ninth for the most reported cases to the hotline. Okay, so Pennsylvania in, in the United States ranks ninth for most reported cases. Many of those reported cases are then uh, identified as real human trafficking cases. Now that's just what's being reported, right? So, um, so that is really important for us to understand. Uh, Villanova Law School also created, and I have uh, their 2021 report. I only have like eight left, so don't fight each other for the last copies, as I know you guys will. No, <laughs> um, if you want more copies of it, I, will, I, I can help make those available. But uh, the Villanova Law School has been doing reports in the state of Pennsylvania for this issue for the past like seven or eight years and have been able to quantify how very real this issue is for us right here in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and those that are being uh, victimized by this and what the resources are. So this is a very real issue for us. Um, lastly, I'll just share, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but we can use intuition in this issue when it comes to sex trafficking. There are characteristics in any city and town that you can, if you look at some of the characteristics that are within a city or town, you can say this is very conducive for sex trafficking to happen. A few of those things is looking at your foster care. How many children are in and out of your foster care or running away from home? Uh, what is the substance abuse issue like in a city and town? If if, if there's an issue with substance abuse and, and, and addiction, there's a, a good likelihood. Um, 
uh, uh, sexual abuse is another one. But you can then also look at the normalization of, of uh, consumer sex. Are there strip clubs in the area? Do you know where prostitution is happening? If all of these things, if you start looking at some of these characteristics and, and seeing that, hey, yeah this, yeah, this is true for us in this area, that is a really good formula to say, you know what, we probably have sex trafficking happening in our area. Yeah, in that list, you kind of go, check. check. Anybody yeah. else do that in your mind? Check, <laughs> check, check, right down the list. Yeah. Uh, shifting a little bit, one of the things that you and I have talked about was how does somebody become a victim? Um, and kind of a, oh man, a blunt, callous question that I, I asked, to be honest with you, is like how, how many of these scenarios start because of somebody's compounding bad choices, mm -hmm. okay? Um, how many of those things, you know, just they build and then that starts. How many of them are people who are um, abducted, taken, like, how does that start? You and I had a lengthy conversation. Yes. This is one of them that I was like really grateful for your grace <laughs> in the conversation. Okay? Yeah. But like, can you unpack that? Speak to yeah. that uh, for a second. Yeah, you know, this is where that, that hiding in plain sight, you start, you know, once you really begin to see um, this issue for what it really is and, and how it works, you begin to see that it's a lot more common than what we think. And it's where the movie Taken really kind of works against us in anti-sex trafficking work. Has anybody seen the movie Taken? A lot of people associate sex trafficking with that type of re recruitment and grooming, that it's young people that are being snatched and then they're held against their will you know, in a room somewhere and being sold, you know, around the world. And um, whereas that, that's a part of sex trafficking. I, I, you know, I would say that's a, some people can be, get involved that way, but it's a very, very small minority. The high majority of people are, are being recruited and groomed when they're children. At, at, at the average age of sex trafficking, for example, one of the stats you'll hear, it, the average age of entry into sex trafficking is 12 to 14 years old. But what was a really light bulb moment for me was to understand this from a, a pimp or trafficker standpoint and what pimps and traffickers are looking for. You know, this is a criminal enterprise. This is a, it's a business. It's a big business, a billion dollar business. There are pimps and traffickers that are wanting to profit off of this and they tell us who they're looking for. They tell us everything we need to know and who are they looking for? They're looking for young vulnerable children. Why young vulnerable children? because they're easy to manipulate and control. It's much easier to control a 14, 15 year old, especially one that has come from a broken home, he or she that's come from a broken home, is in foster care, maybe in uh, DJJ. It's much easier to enter into a relationship with that person and use emotional manipulation and control to, to profit off of them than it is an adult. So how people get involved, it's usually starting when they are young and it is a process of emotional manipulation and control, um, which means that oftentimes it's someone the victim believes is a, is a friend or a family member, someone they trust. There is a relationship of trust that gets formed. And then and I, I'll, I'll just end with this. In my work, one of the most heartbreaking moments, it was, it was a positive and a negative, um, but it was heartbreaking because one of our teen victims, she was 16 years old, and it was a long day in, the, in our center with her when she finally admitted, I'm about to cry, um, when she finally admitted that the person who she thought was her boyfriend and cared for her and loved her and that this trauma bond that she had when she finally could say, he was my pimp. I, I realized he was trafficking me. But that did not come easy for her. And it doesn't come easy for a lot of victims because of that emotional manipulation that happens. People that think the, the people that I thought loved me, cared for me, were looking out for me, were actually people who were exploiting me and abusing me. It's a powerful thing. Uh, he mentioned the criminal enterprise. Some of the statistics I, I heard early on that made me go, wait, hold on a second. Um, was that globally, uh, this is the third largest criminal enterprise in the world. It's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. Number one uh, is drugs. Number two is firearms. Third is human trafficking. Um, in the United States, it's the fastest growing, and about 15 years ago, roughly, it surpassed firearms. It is now the second largest criminal enterprise in the United States. Um, 
and has been for 15 years um, or so, actually a little bit more than that. So um, it, it's massive. Um, we talked a little about this and you talked about the movie Taken and stuff like that, that, that idea. Um, in our conversations, and you hinted at this, but I'm gonna give you a second yep. just to expound it, was we, we had talked a little bit about what's called familial uh, trafficking, which is um, oftentimes it's somebody that you deem or look at as safe, trusted, they have my best interest in mind, and in fact, they, they don't. Um, can you just unpack that and then I'll move on to the next question. You had hinted yeah. at it, I'll give you a minute. To... Yeah, very briefly, you know, and this was one of the hardest realities to confront is that many victims are first exploited by their family, and this was really hard to, to grapple with, but it's a uh, uh, it was not, it's amazingly, and I remember, again, being kind of a disbelief, you know, there's no way this could actually be real, you know, and true, but it is. Um, and we had many mentees at Mortal Life where it was a, a father or a father figure that was their first one exploiting them and even pimping them out. Um, an aunt we had uh, in, our, in our work um, and many others, pe people connected kind of, within the family uh, unit. So familiar trafficking is how a lot of people are first groomed and introduced into that lifestyle again, or they're running away from something. You know, the, the youth is running away from their bad family environment into the arms of pimps and traffickers in the world. So um, it's, it's not something that, again, we think of this as like, you know, uh, like an organized crime syndicate that's very powerful and well-funded, and they're just descending on a city and just snatching up, you know, that is not the case. That's not the real picture. You know, the, the, the full picture is that this is happening within community, um, even in our own family units. Right. Um, shifting the lines a little bit. I was even asked this question this morning when somebody walked in and I was like, hey, we're glad you're here. Uh, what are we doing today? And I was just mentioning kind of our conversation. And they even asked honest question, nothing wrong with it. Um, I asked, but, yeah. um, this, is, this is massive. Like, is there really something I can do as just somebody who comes to our church? Um, and I asked that going like, we're just a small church in like the middle of Wilkesbury. Like what, what exactly can I do? Um, and so I want to kind of unpack that question a little bit, give yeah. you a chance. Like, so it's global, it's local, right? But it's, this is massive. Mm -hmm. um, and on one end, it almost seems daunting even to consider the fact, let's put them out of business. Um, so like, it seems overwhelming, yeah. okay? And I, I'm sure that I'm not the only one in the room who feels that. Mm -hmm. Can you just speak to that uh, for, for a second? Yeah, yeah, you know, the, this is where hope comes in, but also the, the work is already being done. And redemption and healing and the end of sex trafficking is already in place. In fact, Restore Church, you guys are already, there's things that you're doing that are already making a, a greater impact and difference in this issue. So the good news is you don't have to do much different. It's not like you have to add on a bunch of other things that you have to do as a church. It's to do the things you're doing, maybe with even greater intentionality and, and energy behind them. But, you know, all the things you're doing to provide for, uh, to, to help people with uh, food assistance, um, uh, at-risk youth, reaching out to at-risk youth, helping people uh, in addictive behaviors. All, there's a lot that you're already doing. But here's what I get a lot of times. The prevention work, which I get most excited about and am very passionate about, ultimately, the ultimate end of, of sex trafficking in our community is by putting it out of business. And what th that means for me is reducing and ending the buyer demand for consumer sex. It is the dollars that are flowing in to prostitution, pornography, adult uh, entertainment venues. The money that's flowing into there is what is incentivizing pimps and traffickers to do what they do. Here's the good news about that, because this is something I get quite often, which is you'll never be able to end the demand. And what I say is there are people getting free every single day. What makes us think that's going to stop, right? There are men and women that are getting free from consumer sex every single day. God is leading most of these people to do that. People are breaking free and they're no longer addicted to pornography. They're no longer soliciting prostitution. Freedom is possible. So for me, it's like, why, why would we stop doing that? <laughs> why would we just give in and say, well, it's impossible and we're never gonna be able to end it? No, God is already doing the work, amen? 
For us, it just means how can we create a, a little bit more intentionality, make it a little bit more available, you know, how can we increase those efforts rather than just, again, hang our head down low and say, well, nothing can be done, so we might as well just go home. Yeah, so a couple of things that uh, he just mentioned I'll hit on, and then we'll wrap up. Um, we're, we are already doing stuff in this yeah. arena, okay? Um, uh, one of the ways we're doing it is we're trying to attack the environment that creates vulnerable people. That's right. um, and so that's, I don't know if you made this connection, but that's one of the reasons why we give out close to 30,000 pounds of food a month. Okay? Yeah, that's amen. one of the reasons. You can clap for that. Okay? It's because somebody in a situation that's questioning, where do I find my next meal? They are, they are somebody who's in a vulnerable spot who may consider options that they would never have thought they would have considered in the past. Yep. Okay, um, and so we're trying to attack it and build relationships with individuals in that scenario. Uh, another one is through Care Portal and working with our county. Uh, we have a close relationship with people in our county who are trying to help and get involved with at-risk uh, kids and youth before they enter into the foster care system. We are heavily involved in that already. You guys are heavily involved in that already uh, just by associating with the church and some of you with your hands, your, your finances are already heavily involved. Um, we're already working with an organization called Twigs that uses our building throughout the week. I don't even know if you knew this um, because we didn't talk about it from the stage or anything, but that works with people who have been in highly traumatic situations, some of them these situations, and are helping them through therapy and counseling work through some of those things to find healing and to find security and find safety and find uh, some stability, and it's amazing. Okay? And so we're already engaged in this, and we have people in our church that have come to me saying, I will carry this. Mm -hmm. okay? This isn't all falling on me. It's not all falling on Tim Walker. We're, we're just saying, yeah, okay, we'll help. Let's go. Okay? Um, so let, let me point a couple things out to you. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, following our time together, in a moment we're going to respond to the message. I'm going to give you a second to do that. The band's going to come up. We're going to sing a final song and be dismissed. As you're dismissed, I would love to invite you to hang out in the lobby for a couple minutes. There's a couple tables out there. Let me tell you about them. Uh, the first one, uh, you see all the way across over uh, between like the kids check-in and heading out into uh, the back parking lot and the restrooms. Uh, you'll find an organization called Twigs there. This is the organization we partner with that does stuff with counseling, therapy, helping people through traumatic stuff, um, and it's, it's significant. It's awesome, okay? Uh, we're already involved and partnered with them, and we're pumped uh, to do that, okay? So check them out. Check it out. Uh, Sarah will be there at the table. She runs that organization. Ask her questions. Engage her. Uh, she would love to talk with you. Um, Derek's going to be at this table. As you head out, there's a table with a red tablecloth to your left. Um, you can check that out. Oh, let me back up. Twigs, one of the ways that they do that, significant ways through art therapy. And so on the table, you'll see a ton of art. That art is produced. And you're not going to see a signature and name at the bottom, but that art is from individuals who have gone through some of those uh, processes and therapy and found healing and stuff. And that art is then uh, on display, and there's some cool stuff uh, around the corner with that. But check that out. It's pretty beautiful. Okay, uh, On the red table, you'll find two different organizations. One is Gateway to Freedom. This is the one that Derek uh, runs. Um, check it out. Grab some information. He's got some cool stuff there. Um, definitely ask him questions and talk to him. Um, also at that table, you'll also find Brent and uh, Kelly, and they will be there. Um, Brent and Kelly uh, are the couple that kind of are the regional, I'm going to say regional, is that the right word, kind of regional representatives for the Yako Boyan's um, ministries. Um, there's a whole story behind how this thing started. It's incredible. But um, they kind of run this in the region, in northeast Pennsylvania. They're based locally. Um, I've had numerous opportunities to interact with them. I love them. Um, check them out and ask some questions. One of the things I will highlight for you is on February 4th, um, Kelly and her team are doing a uh, a seminar uh, February 4th it's a Saturday uh, she's got all the information there. it's called women warriors and it's just women who are um, looking to be involved ask questions learn more um, about this issue as well as other highly traumatic issues but you could engage that ask her some specific questions if you have any interest talk with her she'll get you the information on that the other thing you'll find at both of those tables is an iPad okay that iPad uh, will have some information um, regarding until uh, they are all free until all are free a workshop that's going to be happening on February 25th. Can you guys throw that slide up? Okay, so this workshop is something Derek and I have been talking about uh, along with our partners that I just mentioned. 
Um, we're going to be hosting this on February 25th. It's free, lunch included, uh, but it's a, a workshop, a seminar to basically, our goal is to raise our hand in our community to say, hey, if you want to have a conversation about that, come here, because we're going to have it. Um, and we're just going to try to facilitate and network people who are doing some things and try to build those conversations. Okay, it's free. Um, my question to you, or my invitation to you, is anybody in our church who wants to come to that, come. Uh, it is for you. It is also for anybody connected to any other church that wants to come. It is also connected to um, county agencies, um, the task force for Northeast Pennsylvania uh, for anti-human trafficking, um, all kinds of different organizations. We are inviting them to come to this because we are trying to just bring the conversation. I've had numerous of those agencies say to me already, give me the information, I'll be there. Um, I'm pumped about that, mm -hmm. okay? Um, what it looks like from there, to be honest, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that there are people in our church who are passionate or saying, hey, I wanna help. Mm -hmm. um, I know that when we get those people together, we can do some pretty cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm excited about that. Uh, there's already some things in the work and some conversations that are happening, which are fantastic. So if that's something that you would uh, find helpful or you'd love to be there, uh, Derek will be doing the primary uh, load of that teaching mm -hmm. on the 25th of February, uh, walking us through a little bit more detail on statistics, understanding what it all looks like, um, and then walking forward with uh, coming up with a strategy of how we can engage, okay? And so I'd love to invite you to that. All right, let me, let me pray real quick to kind of close this conversation and then we'll uh, wrap up, uh, move into the wrapping up of our time together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. God, I wanna thank you and praise you because as we're talking about rescuing people from slavery, uh, this is checkered all the way through scripture that this is who you are and what you do. And I praise you for that. And God, I do praise you and I worship you because for me and my friends in this room, many of us, this is, um, man, the details are different in our stories. But you heard us when we cried out. You saw us and you rescued us. And so God, I pray that as you have done that in our lives, you have told us to turn and go um, and bring that hope and the message and the good news of Jesus Christ to others, that they might find that same redemption. And so, God, I pray that you would, you would do amazing things. God, a bold prayer. But God, I ask that you would end it. I see you put them out of business. I, I pray that you would just... There are millions of kids that are in these situations. They're vulnerable. They're innocent. They're helpless. And God, I pray that you would rescue them. God, I pray that you would hold accountable <laughs> those who... Uh, it's at their hands that these children and these others are finding this kind of abuse. God, I pray that you would do amazing things, and God, I pray that you would use us. God, I pray that um, you would give us eyes to see, um, give us the ability to understand, and I pray that you would give us the courage to, to bring hope um, into some of the darkest moments of people's lives. We pray these things in your name. Amen.